Shareholders and corporations alike want a good return on their investment. Does that mean they can't turn a profit without sacrificing social responsibility? Our next guest says corporations can indeed find a balance. Here's Roger Martin, author of Fixing the Game, Bubbles, Crashes, and What Capitalism Can Learn from the NFL. And it's great to have you back here for day two of our conversation. Thanks. I want to quote to you a guy that I suspect you've heard of. Mm -hmm. Milton Friedman. Yes. I, yes <laughs> here I we have. go. <laughs> Milton Friedman, who uh, 50 years ago said the following, there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits, so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud. Uh, all these years later, has the thinking changed in the classrooms and boardrooms of this, or any other continent for that matter, about what Milton Friedman just said? In, in, in a sense, yes, and in a sense, no. So what I would say is that that, uh, that, that that quote from a, a New York Times magazine article uh, um, has had a huge impact, and it's the default assumption. So if a, I would say that if a corporation can't come up with a better way of thinking about it, they say, well, I can default to this. Milton Friedman said this, and this is the argument uh, that he made. He made this, again, very simple argument that said, hey, if people, if shareholders want to have, you know, do good stuff for the world, take their dividends from that company that makes all, you know, as much money as humanly possible, and use those dividends to uh, to, to fund things about the world they want. But, but the business it, of business is business. Is, is business. So so I think that's been the default uh, assumption, and and for that reason, you know, in default assumptions, I always uh, I say it's like your factory setting. I mean, huh? uh, all your all, all your household appliances come with a factory setting. Uh, and it stays set that way. Like my, my VCR still blinks at me because I don't know how to program VCRs. You still have a VCR? <laughs> well, I, I do. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and we're going to uh, move you up to a PVR one a of these days, yes, okay? Yes, no, that I need a PVR, <laughs> but I probably couldn't program it either. And so, so in some sense, the factory settings often often prevail in in life. And I would say the factory setting is still that, even though I think, I think. Uh, that is a that's a, not a very optimistic uh, view of the world. But did the factory setting persist in the minds of business people, ratings agencies, congressmen, yes. uh, agencies of government in 2008, which led to the meltdown? Yes, you think so? I, I think so. I think it was still that doesn't say that everybody felt that way, but uh, there was enough of that factory setting that enough people. Uh, uh, felt that way, and, and I would and I would say still a lot do because I mean again it's 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 like me and my ele electronic uh, equipment unless I have a way if, unless I have some knowledge that helps me do something other than the factory setting, the factory setting I think uh, prevails, and that's and that's where I would give I would say that uh, the you know business educators uh, have not been leaderly enough in creating easy to use. Uh, uh, methods that would help the factory setting change. So that's still the the factory setting. But let me understand: Are you saying that the fact part of what includes that factory setting is this little category here, which says ethics are not that important to what we do? You see, I think Milton Friedman had an even more you know if an even more powerful point. He said it's ethical to do that, right? So he didn't say, don't be ethical. The business of business is business. He said it is maximally ethical if you're running a business to make the business of business be business. That's why it's a clever argument. You have to give, he's a Nobel laureate, you've got to give him his, his props uh, <laughs> for coming up with, again, a very simple thing, like we were talking about uh, uh, yesterday, right, stock-based compensation, so, you know, s uh, s uh, uh, similar, these, these deceptively sim uh, simple uh, arguments. And, and that's, why, that's why it'll last until there's another argument that is a more compelling argument uh, than that. So the people a couple of decades ago who invented these, or maybe it was more than that, who invented these things called derivatives which suddenly exploded in 2008 and helped uh, nearly bring down the whole international economy. They didn't, how, how much in your view did they care about the fact that if these things went south, they were gonna bring the whole house of cards down with them? I, I don't think they even thought about it. 
So I think the because the, they the, thought it wouldn't happen, or yeah. because they didn't care. No, I think more because they didn't they didn't couldn't imagine it it, it happening. I, I I think. I mean, I think the people who invented all those derivatives and, and the like and how to value them, like Fisher Black and Myron Scholes with the, the famous Black Scholes option pricing theorem, they were just trying to figure something out, and they didn't know how it was uh, going to be used e eventually. Uh, so it, it is. It, I mean, it is sort of inventing. Uh, it's it's like Oppenheimer, right? You invent the bomb, and and you don't you don't contemplate. You say, well, it's to help us win win the war against totalitarians. But surely we'll never use it. Yes, and surely we'll never use it. And and oh, there would never have both sides each have about fifteen thousand of these uh, rock, you know, del delivered by rockets uh, and able to annihilate the world at the height of the Cold War. So I, I, I think it would be a similar thing, which is which is they're trying to figure out something. Uh, in, in that case with derivatives, how to hedge risk and, and share risk and lower the riskiness of the system instead of raising it to the, to the higher heights than anybody could have imagined and then having it go kaboom. But at a certain point, there must have been some people on Wall Street, probably not on Bay Street, but probably on Wall Street, who said, boy, you know, if this ever went bad, it would really go bad, and yet nobody changed their behavior even though that light bulb went on. Yes. Why not? Well, here's where I think, again, I, th I think the incentive structures in, on Wall Street uh, just, just aren't, aren't very healthy. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a view to too great an extent, and I think it still prevails. If we can do it, if it's legal to do it, do it. Damn the torpedoes. Yeah. Uh, so can we, and is it legal? If it is, whatever, whatever happens. Uh, happens and and I just think that's that's just you know it's it's sad it's sad, it's sad in a really quite profound way because truly the the proverbial man on the street is taking it in the teeth still right I mean geez it's it's five years later and and uh, we still don't have uh, haven't cleared all the wreckage uh, from that that financial crash and no one's gone to jail no no that's uh, and part of it is most of most of what it was uh, was was it legal. It was just, is it legal? Can we do it? Sure, let's uh, uh, let's uh, try. As opposed to, as opposed to, you'd hope some of these people would ask the questions, questions like, hey, what am I doing on the planet? Uh, am I trying to make it a better planet or a, a worse planet? Not, you know, can I get away with this thing that I'm doing? Well, that takes us to the Aspen Institute <laughs> in the year 2001. Yes, <laughs> and a corporate social responsibility. Uh, seminar that you went to, and I wonder after you heard that seminar, what did you realize? I realized that the l people who were leading the thinking at that time on on how to integrate uh, corporate social responsibility, environmental sustainability, etc., into business decisions um, weren't thinking enough about about actionability, about could you take their hopes, wishes, and desires and, and give it to a, to a CEO or some other senior executive and say, here, here, can you make a decision on the basis of this that's different and better than you did before? And my view was what was coming out was, was the answer of the CEO would be, cool, that, that sounds neat, but I have no idea how I can, I can interleave this into, into my uh, decisions. And so I said, boy, if, we're, if, uh, if that's the direction that thinking world is going, which is sort of abstract kind of ideas and, and admonitions, gee, Steve, be a better CEO, we're going to get nowhere. Uh, and when I get my dander up a little, which I did, I was sort of like, we're going to get nowhere. Why, why are we doing this? <laughs> and I was, I was at this session for three days. And so in the middle of the session, I, I, I came up with what I thought is a way that I could imagine uh, a CEO thinking about his, her, her job in a way that would be expansive. You know, here's how I can do and, not or, right? Here's a, how, I can, how I can take care of my uh, shareholders, take care of my customers, take care of my employees, a and make the world a better place. Is that the virtue matrix? That is. Okay. That is. Let's, because this is a great segue then. We're going to bring a picture of this thing okay. up and you can take us through it. There's a monitor right over my yeah, shoulder. Yeah. Sketch out how this briefly works for us and uh, Go ahead, control room. Let's bring this up. And we're, so, we're in Roger Martin's class here. Okay, <laughs> terrific. So the so the idea is is that is that there is in the world a, uh, a, a what I call a civil foundation. So this is the here and now, uh, and it is made up of two big pieces. 
uh, the piece on the right and the piece on the left of the lower of the lower box, which which are which are on the lower right, the rules and regulations of of the economy, and on the lower left, it's the sort of the norms and conventions uh, that uh, that are in place in in, in various industries and, and, and countries. So. Uh, so job one, in some sense, of, of a corporation, if it wants to be a good corporation, I would argue, is it has to make sure it has, it has procedures inside that it obeys all the rules and, and regulations that are imposed on that industry, companies in general. And, and a really good company would say, I'm going to make sure I ab ab abide by all the norms and conventions that our industry uses. So if I'm in a city, like I know Calgary and Minneapolis are big at this, where they have a 1% club where all the companies uh, uh, in, 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 in the city give 1% of pre-tax profit to, to, to charity, well, you would adopt, you'd abide by that. Um, and if and it's, if it's becoming uh, kind of the norm to give benefits to same uh, same sex couples b before there's any law uh, about it, you obey those norms. That's sort of the here and now. And what I say is is if you're a company and you're abiding by that, you're making sure you're you're keeping the civil foundation strong. Uh, then the top the top half of, of of that of that matrix is what I call the frontier. This is stuff that the world doesn't yet have. Uh, so it's it's the the what might be the possibilities, and what I say there is you've got two pieces of it: the strategic frontier and the structural frontier. Mm -hmm. The strategic frontier is the territory where you could do something that makes the world a better place, but provides also enough rewards from your customers or your or your uh, employees that it makes economic sense for you. Uh, and so Anita Roddick in the body shop would be a perfect example. She says, I'm, I want to I wanna open a shop that sells products that do not uh, uh, have uh, uh, beauty products that, that do not involve testing on animals that will harm uh, animals. She opens her shop. People, People support love it. it. Yeah. They love the idea. They love the idea. Customers uh, flood in. And so she's making the world a better place and making a buck. Mm -hmm. The good thing about that box is what happens then to all her competitors? They say, gee, hmm. that was a good idea. And they copycat. And then what does it come, become? It becomes a norm or custom in that, in that industry. And that's why the arrows go back down. So in some sense, Anita Roddick's value is that she went into the frontier, tried something new to make the world a better place, was rewarded with with enough business that it made it attractive enough that everybody does it and it rolls down it's the same with uh, a, a great canadian ron barbaro is the first uh, insurance uh, mm -hmm. ceo when he ran prudential canada to put viatical settlements into uh, into insurance life insurance contracts that would enable aid sufferers to use their their uh, death benefits in advance of dying to help with their own health care now it's standard fare in in all uh, in all life insurance contracts. There's just a little clause that they might as well call the Ron Barbaro clause because he went into the frontier and was, co and was copycatted. Now, there are some stories that aren't so easy, right? And that's the structural frontier where there are so many what economists call externalities. You, do, you as a company don't get to capture the benefits that you're doing for society. So let's say you're the only cement company that says, you know what? We're going to put extra you know, scrubbers in our stacks and have a slower process. And I know it's going to cost us more to produce cement in a more environmentally friendly way, but we're going to do it. And then nobody buys your cement because it's above market price. So all the value you're creating goes essentially out the, out the door, and nobody copycats it mm -hmm. in that industry. In that world, though, in the structural frontier, what you have to do is use coalitions. If you get all the cement manufacturers together, which then in fact works. happened, then it works. Uh, and often you go and get the cement manufacturers together and say to governments, here's how you should regulate us all more stringently so that we do make the world a better place. And that's where the arrows go down again in, in the diagram, because often when you take action in the structural frontier, uh, governments help by or follow it up by making it the law so it then becomes part of the civil foundation. Is it a rare situation though where companies will go to government and say please regulate us we're not regulated enough? They, they, yes but I think it's happening it's happening more uh, hmm. where companies are, are saying are saying consumers care about this uh, but the big problem is cheaters so if three of us do it and then all these other people cheat 
uh, it's not going to be sustainable. And so government can actually help enforce non-cheating. Non hmm. But so what I say is that if you, if you go into the frontier, either the strategic or structural frontier, make something happen, what it does is eventually ends up in the civil foundation and that strengthens the civil foundation. I say it ratchets it up so that you have a bigger, stronger, deeper civil foundation. And so I think a company can show great social responsibility in a very organized fashion by saying, we have to think about each of these quadrants. Are we obeying all the rules and regulations and doing in a very thorough way, not accidentally uh, kind of not doing it? Are we always uh, adopting all the good norms and conventions in our industry? And then do we have at least a project at any time going on exploring the strategic frontier and exploring the structural frontier? That corporation can say after 20 or 30 years, here's how we contributed to strengthening, deepening the civil foundation of our society and we've made money for our shareholders while doing it. That, my hope, right, is, <laughs> is that that can be a new factory setting, right? Well, That's a simple procedure for you to do, and you can do it, and it doesn't say, ah, you have to make a gigantic trade-off and make all those shareholders impoverished and unhappy to do this. No, it says explore, explore the frontier, take care of the foundation, explore the frontier, and there are benefits for you of exploring the, the frontier. It's not riskless, but uh, there, there are benefits worth, uh, worth going for. I like this expression, factory setting, because it, <laughs> it, it reminds me that, and I think I read this in one of your papers, about a factory in Lawrence, Massachusetts, yes. where the guy did everything you would hope a boss would do, and in the end, it didn't matter anyway. Yes. You want to tell us yeah, that story? Yeah, sure. Aaron Feuerstein, uh, uh, Malden Mills. Uh, so he had a factory exactly in western Massachusetts, which used to have a textile, uh, a vibrant textile industry. But his factory burnt down. He took the $300 million insurance uh, settlement, because it, it, it burnt down and he had fire insurance, rebuild in Malden Mills, and sure enough, uh, it went bankrupt. And so that was, again, a structural frontier problem. Nobody was willing to pay an extra premium for him to hire higher priced uh, Western Massachusetts labor instead of Mexican labor or, uh, or Costa Rican but, labor or the like. So and what's the lesson? This guy does the right thing. He could have taken the money. He didn't have to rebuild. He could have lived a wonderful life. He thought, I got all these employees who've depended on me for years and years and years. So I'm going to rebuild. I do. And then I'm out here all by myself. And at the end of the day, He's in bankruptcy protection. Yeah. What's the lesson? The, the lesson is you have to think really carefully about where you, are you on the strategic frontier or structural frontier uh, uh, box, in essence. And so you have to be asking yourself the question, can I do something that will get, get a payoff, will get customers uh, showing, showing greater loyalty paying, paying a, or paying a premium, or regulators or, or suppliers or somebody? And if the case is not, then your second choice, right, is can I get all the, the kind of textile manufacturers uh, together to do, to do something? But if you just tried yourself and haven't thought about the economics of it, that's where, that's where it, will, it, it won't work. It'll be, a, it'll be a, a, a sad story. And in his case, I mean, it would have been just as effective for him to take the $300 million and distribute it to his, his, his employees who, who'd lost their jobs because of the fire to say, this will, this will help uh, uh, cushion the blow and help you kind of move or, 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 or get training for another job or the like. And that's, that's what I would say would make the world a better place in, in, uh, in that case. It just so, feels like no good deed goes unpunished, you know? Sometimes, yes, but I think you can, see, my point would be you can analyze your way to that. You, you don't have to guess, and you don't have to spend the $300 million without thinking about it uh, and asking the question, where are you? Are you toward the left, where, where there's more chance of you capturing the value? And it's also not like, I, I, I guess I would question, I don't know enough uh, uh, to know about what all the things he did or did not uh, uh, do, but I would have said, if you're going to try that, you're going to have to have a strategy mm -hmm. that says we are going to appeal to customers. We're going to identify that about our, our product and say, do you want to? It's sort of, do you want to buy American? Do you care? Do you care about that? Or here's how our workers uh, can make something that's better 
uh, than, than the, the workers elsewhere uh, so that it affords the premium. That's what I'd want them to think about is how can I push it towards the strategic frontier where there will be a positive market response to me, my company, not just a, not just a hey, you're, you're, one of the, you're one of the many and we, and we as consumers had no idea that you rebuilt your mill. Gotcha. Talk to us about the uh, RBC. You worked with RBC mm -hmm. on the Virgin Matrix. Yeah. What was that about? Well, uh, they, they saw the, the work, and I think they're you know, a good company and, and, and want to do the right thing. And, and so they, they came to us and said, can you develop a strategy for us based on that? And so we, we went through, through the four, four boxes and, and, uh, and developed a, a, a virtual matrix strategy for them. And they picked certain areas where they, were, uh, they wanted to work, water uh, being, uh, being one of them. And, um, and it seemed they, they found it very effective to rather than saying, saying, gee, we have to be nice in all sorts of uh, little ways to say, how can we, how can we have things that would really matter uh, to our customers? And yet in spite of that, they got hammered on that temporary workers thing. Yeah, no, and, and I, I, I think it's, I mean, it's sad in the sense that I think they're, they're really terrific people, but it is, it's, it's, it is a, uh, a cautionary tale, I guess, which is that in this modern world, um, you have to be you have to be asking a set of questions that you didn't have to probably ask before, and 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 the questions, uh, you know, in a funny sort of way, Steve, the 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 you know newspaper question is the quest is is the question you always want to ask, is what I'm doing today something that I would want splashed. Uh, uh, on the newspaper, and mm -hmm. and and I, and for me, I think probably the, the the trigger point is: Do you really want to have your existing workers training their lower cost uh, replacements? Let's, with our last few minutes here, do one more thing, and that is: I'm going to read you the preamble from the MBA oath created by the Harvard Business School graduates in 2009. And here's how it goes. As a manager, my purpose is to serve the greater good by bringing people and resources together to create value that no single individual can build alone. Therefore, I will seek a course that enhances the value of my enterprise can create for society over the long term. I recognize my decisions can have far-reaching consequences that affect the well-being of individuals inside and outside my enterprise today and in the future. Now, that's a long way from the business of business is business. Mm -hmm. And it sounds great. But once these kids get into the real world and they discover that bonuses are paid for performance, and if you don't perform, you're out the door, what do you think happens to that oath? Well, I, I, I think that is unactionable knowledge, is, is, is my, my view. Now, I, I'm, uh, I've had some very harsh things to say about the, these business school oaths. This, this I'm more keen on because it's student generated. And I think I, think I view that as a cry for help. They're saying to their their business school institution, "Teach us How to, to be, be able to to be able to live up to that oath." Mm -hmm. What I hate actually is there are business schools that are actually insisting that their students uh, sign and take and sign an oath like that, and then not teaching them how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's and 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 what I would say is that is that uh, you know that's my alma mater. You know I love Harvard Business School in some in some in many respects, not just some, uh, but. I don't think that they've risen to the challenge of teaching a student how to go out into the world and do that. Uh, and that's, that's, that's what we're trying to do with our we're work on the virtue matrix and a whole strategy uh, around that to be, able to, teach, to be able to teach students something actionable so that they can have a framework for thinking their way through things. Because I, I think that's the bigger challenge, Steve, than the, the incentive or compensation system will get them. It's that they don't have a toolbox, and they have a toolbox from their business school typically that helps them to fulfill uh, uh, Milton Friedman's wishes for them, uh, and they don't have a toolbox generally taught to them that would fulfill uh, the w the wishes of that oath, and that is what we've got to do. And in my view, I think it is it is unseemly to ask students to sign an oath that you do not teach them how to fulfill. So is the real progress of the future then more in the boardroom than the classroom? No, I think it's both. I mean, I, I, think, I think we have to lead. I, I honestly think, Steve, that the business school uh, world writ large has to, has to start pumping out students 
who, who have a different factory setting, right, mm -hmm. who find it easier to make decisions on the basis of something like the virtue matrix or equivalent technique than they find it to make decisions uh, using, using Milton Friedman's advice. And if we pump them out with that, uh, that factory setting in due course, that'll dominate. Because the good news about, see the good news about business, uh, the world of business is it's quite sort of, I think of it as sort of bloody minded. If something works, they'll keep on doing it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and everybody will copy and replicate. It's a world full of copying and, 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 and replicating. Uh, the great and if ethics was the thing they wanted to copy. Exactly. Hmm. But we'll only be able to do that when we give them a framework and tools for doing it. That's, that's why I've been obsessed yeah. about, about this ever since 2001. Give them frameworks and tools because I watch them and, and you know, in, our, in our course on that they have to go out and apply the virtue matrix to something and, and they come back. They can do it. They can absolutely do it. Uh, it's just it's got to get uh, that and others more ubiquitously uh, used. I can't tell you how much we've enjoyed having you here these last couple of days. Fixing the Game is your latest book, which we recommend to uh, everybody. And uh, we wish you well with the Martin Prosperity Institute. Named after your parents, we remind everybody, not yes. you. Yes. Roger Martin, thanks so much for joining us here on TVO. It's always a pleasure coming on and talking to Steve. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.